All right, we want to shift over and focus on the uh, the movement to gain uh, legal equality for African American citizens, and so we're going to focus on the development of legal rights for African Americans uh, in terms of citizenship and how it has impacted schooling and uh, how it has impacted equal treatment from there. So we'll be looking at a lot of just steps in a legal process here. All right, we're gonna start at a real low point. We're gonna focus on citizenship development first, and we're gonna start at a real low point, the worst decision of our Supreme Court in 1857. We've talked about it a little bit already, um, but the Dred Scott v. Sanford case. The Dred Scott v. Sanford case decided right before the Civil War. The situation with Dred Scott is kind of complicated. He um, had been enslaved in a state with slavery, and then he was taken to Illinois, which was a free state. And he uh, lived there with uh, the person who owned him for many years, and so like he was freed at that point, since there was no slavery in Illinois. And then um, he was he returned to Louisiana, and when uh, the person who owned him died, he tried to get his own freedom. He tried to purchase his freedom, um, and uh, the widow refused. So he tried to sue in court. So Dred Scott v. Sanford is really just about a, uh, a former a, a man who had been enslaved, um, suing to uh, guarantee his his freedom. And um, so he went before the court, and this is in 1857 with Roger B. Taney, our, our worst Supreme Court justice, um, and he was ruled that, that black people could not be citizens, um, that, that Dred Scott was property, and therefore he was not a citizen, and he did not have standing to sue in court. So the court didn't, didn't even think about, they didn't deal with Dred Scott's situation much at all. They dealt with whether or not he even had a right to use the court. So the court's ruling went beyond just Dred Scott. They ruled that any descendants of Africans could not be citizens in the United States. That's what they thought the Constitution said. Um, so this, this ruling in Dred Scott not only like harms Dred Scott, but says... In fact, no African Americans can be citizens. And uh, it also went further. This is the first time since Marbury v. Madison that the Supreme Court struck down a national law. It said that since slaves are property, Congress has no ability or no uh, jurisdiction or powers to ban slavery anywhere. So um, Congress has no ability to take those property rights away from slave owners. And so uh, this denied Congress's ability to limit slavery anywhere. So a terrible decision here that not just hurt Dred Scott, but said that no African Americans can be citizens and that slaves, uh, since they are property, slavery cannot be limited anywhere. So uh, from here, we have to go forward and get to a place where we can talk about equal protection. So that was 1857 for Dred Scott. And then of course in 1860, we have a civil war. And so the country is split in half and fighting over slavery and whether or not slavery will continue. So civil war is over. The civil war is over and it is time to make some serious and significant changes to the constitution. So we have these post-war constitutional amendments. The 13th Amendment, you guys know, this prohibits slavery anywhere in the United States. So an amendment to the Constitution that bans slavery. Uh, just three years later, of course, that does not go far enough. The states would just say, okay, no slaves, um, and, and not grant any equality to those people. So the 14th Amendment goes further. It grants citizenship rights to all former slaves, and actually the wording, to all people born in the United States. Um, so that takes care of citizenship. And then the things we've been talking about, the 14th Amendment knows that the states will not uh, do any more than the bare minimum. So it defines citizenship. Uh, it says that states must give all citizens privileges and immunities, right? Remember, treat every citizen of the country exactly the same way that you treat the citizens of your state, no special privileges and things like that. Uh, it says that the states cannot deny life, liberty, or property without due process. That's our due process clause. 
and it says that states must guarantee the equal protection of the law to all citizens. So the 14th Amendment goes a long way to not just saying all these people are citizens, but defining what citizenship means and how you have to treat a citizen. And of course, 14th Amendment also didn't go quite far enough because it didn't specifically say uh, that people could vote. And so um, states were not allowing people the right to vote. So the 15th Amendment was passed a couple years after that. And the 15th Amendment prevents states from denying the right to vote based on account of race. So three amendments real quick in five year period, uh, 13, 14, 15, uh, make great strides towards uh, legal equality in the Constitution. This period right after the Civil War is what we call Reconstruction. It's about the like you know the country rebuilding itself and all that. But the important part for us is that there were really harsh limits placed on the governments of the southern states. Um, those included like preventing any former Confederate officers from holding office. Um, it included sending the U.S. military into these southern states um, and uh, and and forcing those states to not just ratify the amendments, but uh, to, uh, to, to put those amendments into effect. So for the states, the southern states, for them to return to the United States, they had to ratify 13, 14, and 15. And once they were ratified, the U.S. Army was there to ensure that those, the provisions of those amendments were followed. So the Army stayed in the states in the south to make sure that those states... Uh, treated citizens equally, that it allowed people to vote and things like that. Reconstruction was really successful. It worked. The first 10 years after the Civil War, uh, the first 10 years after the 15th Amendment, African American men are voting at incredibly high rates. African American men are uh, winning offices at the state level and at the national level. All of our first black senators and congressmen are from the 1870s. Uh, Mississippi was one of the first states to elect a black person to the Congress. So this has like th this really, really worked and was an effective policy. And then the 1876 election is one where uh, it went to the House of Representatives, like Congress was deciding, and there was a congressional like deal. And the result of that deal was that the Republican president would take over, like the Republican would win the election in return for the military leaving those states in the South. And so after 1876, the military left those states and uh, things got much, much worse and those policies were no longer effective. So as soon as the Southern states had an opportunity to, they started implementing policies that we kind of like group all these together as what we call Jim Crow laws. Um, and these are like policies that are uh, segregation and other forms of like official like state policy discrimination, like laws about who could own what and things like that. Um, so these were trying to like reverse the changes that took place during Reconstruction. We'll get into the voting stuff more specifically, but like, you know, the 15th Amendment says even African-American men have to be able to vote. And so the state governments in this period would put in things like literacy tests and poll taxes and things like that, that, that weren't technically like racial in their policy, but like had the effect of uh, racial discrimination. And that was purposeful. And so um, all of these laws reversed a lot of that like policy progress. And then um, in, in some cases, some civil rights cases in the 1880s, what they ruled is that the 14th Amendment, which requires equal protection of the law, did not um, prevent businesses from discriminating. And so this left any private business with the ability to discriminate in any way that it wanted. So we have, we end up with systems where businesses will like only serve white customers and things like that. All right, so a court case that you guys have heard of for sure um, is Plessy versus Ferguson. So this is 1896. So we're like 25 years after the 14th Amendment, and it's time for the court to interpret what the Equal Protection Clause is supposed to mean. So in Plessy versus Ferguson, this is about segregated trains in uh, Louisiana, and uh, Plessy was riding in the white train car instead of the colored train car. 
and uh, this is kind of, you know, he did this on purpose. This was like a test case, um, like a Rosa Parks kind of situation. This is uh, breaking the law on purpose to, uh, you know, create a way to challenge the law. So in Plessy versus Ferguson, um, this went to the Supreme Court and they're trying to, you know, figure out if the segregated train car system violates the uh, 14th Amendment Equal Protection Clause. So what the Supreme Court ruled here is there's a train car for whites and there's a train car for colored people. And so they've created a system where there is equality. Everyone is treated the same because everyone has a train car. And so this is the interpretation of the Supreme Court in 1896. This makes separate but equal the official interpretation of the Equal Protection Clause. So now the Equal Protection Clause, um, you know, has, it, it does not cause any problems with segregation or anything like that because the court defines equal protection as separate but equal. And so uh, we have, you know, we have a long period of official segregation that is at this point, you know, been given the thumbs up by the Supreme Court. All right, now the 14th Amendment was not the only amendment that the states were getting around. The 15th Amendment, um, which gave African-American men the right to vote, uh, was also being circumvented by the states with uh, you know, all sorts of policies like poll tax, uh, literacy tests, and things like that. Um, but another thing they did is the 15th Amendment says that, they can't, that African-American men can't be denied the right to vote in federal or state elections. So... A primary where you choose a political party's candidate is actually an election run by the political party. They can limit who votes in those. For example, a lot of states only allow Democrats to vote in the Democratic primary or the Republican primary only allows Republican voters and things like that. So political parties, since they are private groups for all of the years from 1870 to 1944, um, political parties were preventing um African-American voters from being able to participate. So these were called white primaries. And so a white primary was a political party election where only the white political party members were allowed to vote. And that meant that when African-Americans finally got the chance to vote, they were choosing between candidates who uh, were selected only by white people so far. Um, and so the court, uh, this is 1944, so we're getting closer to modern time here, and the court rules on the side of uh, the voters and said that uh, Smith, in this case, uh, he was denied equal protection if the Democratic Party kept him out. So this is one of the rare um, victories uh, for African Americans in the courts up to this point. All right, so we're still talking about the same thing. We're still talking about the Equal Protection Clause and interpretation of the Equal Protection Clause, but we're going to shift into a period in the 50s uh, where we start to, a lot of the focus of, on equal protection really came down to schools. So here is, this is Linda Brown uh, in front of the school that, uh, that she sued to get to attend. So uh, we'll go through some of these court cases dealing with schools and equal protection. The rule was still separate but equal. So we're in the 19, 1940s and 50s. The rule is still separate but equal. That's still the precedent of the court. And um, our first court case challenging separate but equal schools is McLaren versus Oklahoma. So a lot of these uh, battles started uh, in like graduate schools because states would have separate school systems up to a certain point but didn't offer every option that was out there so mclaren is a uh, a black man in oklahoma he wants to uh he wants to get a doctorate in education from the university of oklahoma um, oklahoma does not have a separate school system for him in which he could earn a doctorate so there was not like the highest levels of graduate school for him to attend so he sued to get into the University of Oklahoma, which is all white. So his argument here is there is no separate but equal facility. So even though he was prevented from uh, going to the University of Oklahoma, he's asking the court, shouldn't he be allowed to go to Oklahoma since there is no separate but equal facility? And the court sided with him. So this is the first step toward desegregating the schools here. The court ruled that he could not be denied education because of the lack of a facility for him. So Oklahoma had to let him attend the University of Oklahoma. Uh, now, the Oklahoma was, you know, they, they did the bare minimum. They let him in. 
um, but they uh, created a segregated uh, lunch area, segregated library, and uh, state law still banned him from sharing classrooms with white students. So he actually like took all of his classes in, sitting in a desk right outside the hall. Uh, but this is our, you know, our first qu case of the court intervening in schools. So the state saw how that went, um, and this is Texas for Sweat versus Painter. The state saw that Oklahoma, since they didn't have separate but equal facilities, they were forced to desegregate the University of Oklahoma by allowing that one um, African-American student to attend. So in Texas, uh, Sweat wants to go to law school. Uh, Texas didn't have one, didn't have a law school for African-American students. Sweat is an African-American guy. So Texas... Uh, they saw what happened in Oklahoma. They did not want to have the same thing and be ordered to allow him to attend Texas. So Texas literally built a law school just for him. Uh, they created a law school with a full law program and everything, and he's the only student. Um, and this is actually, this is Texas Southern. So uh, Texas Southern still exists today, but this is the reason it had been initially created here. So Sweat still sued. What he argued is even though there are separate but equal facilities, he's not getting a separate or he's not getting an equal education because he doesn't have any uh, like other law students to interact with. He doesn't get to like um, have like, you know, like mock trial activities. He doesn't get to have like debates with other students. He doesn't get to learn from other students and all that. And so the Supreme Court sided with sweat here. The Supreme Court uh, ruled that he was actually not getting an equal education. And so here they start to chip away at the meaning of separate but equal. They say separate but equal does not apply to professional schools. And this were meaning like grad schools, like law schools, medical schools, uh, things like that. So they're starting to get rid of separate but equal educational systems in the graduate school area. And then we get to our big one. So 1954, Brown versus the Board of Education of Topeka. So uh, Linda Brown is our plaintiff here. She was ordered to go to a, uh, a school for black students. So her separate but equal um, school was more than a mile away. It was a, She had to get on a bus and travel more than a mile. There was a white school that was only a few blocks away. And this is always kind of important in a court case. It's not just to like, uh, they're not just arguing that it's unfair, but they're like actually trying to quantify how unfair it is. So this is one of the arguments they made is that like, you know, it's not, it's not equal because of the extra travel and all that kind of stuff. But anyway, you guys know this court case very well. She argued, um, that this was not, that this was not, uh, a, a, you know, an equal protection of the law system. This was straight up challenging the ruling in Plessy versus Ferguson and the Supreme court finally in 1954, overturned the precedent set in Plessy. They ruled that separate but equal is inherently unequal. That's important. So that ordered that schools had to be desegregated, but making the argument that separate but equal is inherently unequal is gonna, that's also gonna create a precedent for these other challenges to segregation laws that we're gonna see in a few minutes. So this is our first one, Brown versus Board of Education, very important. This is the one we have to know by name, of course. I know you guys know this very well. Um, and then actually a year later, we have Brown versus Board two, and the schools were trying to delay stuff. And it was, you know, the, for the states, that is a big change, costs a lot of money, hard to do very quickly. Um, but the court ordered them in Brown versus Board two to desegregate with all deliberate speed. So that's important, that is the court saying like, you know, not like doubling down on their decision. They're saying like our decision was correct, but also like ordering the states to do this. Um, obviously there's problems with implementation and stuff and it happens slowly in the states, but still uh, Brown versus Board of Education desegregates the schools and Brown versus Board of Education too is, is kind of in order to, you know, do this as, as quickly as you can do this. And about 20 years later, we have this other case, Swan versus Charlotte, uh, finally, in like the 70s, we're having like cities really try to do more than they're trying to like actively integrate their school systems here. So uh, cities were experimenting with different programs and we call uh, these things, uh, we call these programs busing. 
which is more than just riding the bus, but basically what they would do is they would, uh, if you guys remember gerrymandering, they would draw really oddly shaped uh, school districts to try to create schools that were racially balanced. So you don't necessarily go to the school that is closest to you, but you uh, the, the districts will be drawn in a way to try to create some kind of diversity and racial balance within the schools. And so in this case, uh, and this is this is about two decades after Brown versus Board, um, but we're trying we're still trying to figure out what is the meaning of Brown versus Board. You know, do you just have to get rid of the desegregation laws? Do you have to make an effort to uh, to, to create diverse schools and things like that? And so in this case, uh, Swan was challenging Charlotte, uh, saying that uh, that Charlotte did not have the right to draw these districts in this way. And that Charlotte, uh, the city of Charlotte was was, you know, not equally protecting all of its citizens this way or whatever. But the court uh, sided with Charlotte, with the city of Charlotte here. And they ruled that Brown versus Board of Education is more than just in order to not segregate, but actually requires the states to take active steps to integrate. So they have to, like, the, that the state should be taking steps to ensure that there is racial diversity and racial balance in their schools. And so uh, this is a really important case for schools as well. This upheld the use of busing. Now this, you know, this was a really successful program too. We did achieve uh, racially, you know, more, more racially integrated schools in cities all across the country. And this is around the same time where we've seen this recently in Memphis. You have the suburbs begin to start their own school districts because um, while this could occur inside a district, you could create... Uh, integrated schools inside a district. You can't really do that across multiple districts. And so uh, this is part of that is, is uh, why, why many of the suburbs were creating their own school systems.